Thank you, Geraldine. Uh, hello, Berlin. So yes, I'm Jamie Paolo. Um, I'm the co-founder with Noni Della Pena of a company called Emblematic Group. And we are dedicated to producing what we call immersive or virtual reality journalism. Um, it's a new kind of hybrid medium. And we think it is a uniquely powerful way of telling certain kinds of news and non-fiction stories. Now, I say we. It's really Noni who is the pioneer of this genre. She's been doing it for eight years before anyone else had even really heard of it. Um, sadly, she can't be here with us today, so I'm here on her behalf. But I have her on video now um, in a clip that's very relevant to what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon. So, without further ado... Do you hear me now, Noni? Nice to meet you. Molt gust. Welcome to Barcelona, Benvinguda Barcelona. I don't know, Noni, if I could ask you to raise your arms. I would see the arms. Uh, keep, them, keep them up, because now we'll show the robot. Can you move them a little bit more? Can you move them a little bit more? Up and down. Now you can see the robot reacts perfectly with the Noni. Noni, I'm ready to interview you now for, for a few minutes. Le farem una entrevista a la Noni per veure què li ha semblat aquesta experiència. You're a journalist, ella és una periodista, i fa una estona entrevistat un científic de Barcelona. You just interviewed a, a researcher from Barcelona, but in a, in a body of a robot. What was that experience like? So, for me, it starts to feel very natural after a while. Um, Occasionally, there's some problems with the, the, the eye movement in my head if I move too fast. But beyond that, very quickly, I'm there in Barcelona with you. Okay, I'm there with you, is what she says at the, at the end of that clip. And that is exactly what we're trying to do, right? We take elements from a variety of um, disciplines, of media and technology and platforms, and we combine them in a way that tries to make you feel like you are there, to really put you on the scene of, um, of a news event or a story. So we're really pulling from three major elements. And the first is kind of classical, what we call classical documentary filmmaking and journalism. We are reporters. We find stories. We, we, we report on those stories. And we gather audio and video footage. So all very traditional elements of an established media. We also pull from the platforms and technologies of video gaming and, and motion pictures of computer-generated images, CGI. Um, so a, a whole industry that knows how to create virtual enver environments that can make you feel like you're somewhere else than you really are. And thirdly, we use what we call the sense of presence. And this is honestly the single most important piece of the experience. It's also the hardest piece to describe unless you've actually done it for yourself. Very simply, it means uh, a physical sense that you are put onto a scene, or we also call it embodiment, that your, your body feels like you're somewhere else. And virtual reality enables you to do, to do this, and it also, being there, generates a very powerful, emotional, empathic response to what you see. So this is really the, this is really the crux of what we do. Okay, so in terms of trying to put you there, put you on the scene, Nothing new. This is actually a very traditional journalistic um, goal, right? The world-famous war correspondent, Martha Gellhorn, used to talk about what she called the view from the ground, meaning she's reporting from the front lines of World War II and trying to give you the sense of what it's like to actually be there. And Walter Cronkite, the godfather of American TV news, had a whole series of sort of TV documentary films called You Are There. And in case you needed a reminder of how cheesy mainstream American media was and still is, just a brief clip from there. These Texians, as they are called, Walter. are Mexican citizens. Their province is part of the Mexican nation, but their difficulties with the central government have steadily increased. Now there is open rebellion. March 5th, 1836. The Siege of the Alamo.
You are there. Okay, so now you know. So again, as, as, you know, it's, it's, it's a, essentially an age-old goal that we're trying to, to reproduce. There is also a tradition within documentary, uh, within um, video gaming, that's not just about entertainment, as most games are, but that also is trying to investigate or edu educate you about uh, historical or political subjects, uh, you know, an alternative tradition within video games. A couple of quick examples. There's a game called JFK Reloaded, which um, puts you uh, at, the, at the site of the assassination of JFK and puts you in the position of being the shooter and is it really possible to take the single fatal shot you know, from the a, a actual physical location? So, uh, so you know, a, a different way of applying a game to an investigation. And secondly, uh, John Kerry's Swift Boat experience, I don't know if you remember, in the presidential campaign between John Kerry and George Bush, there was a far right group that launched this propaganda campaign to discredit Kerry's role um, earning a medal in the, in the Vietnam War as a, on a swift boat. This is a, a game that was put out to combat that and to kind of recreate the situation so you could actually see what it was really like. And thirdly, uh, there are some strong theoretical underpinnings for this emerging medium. There's a whole field of academic studies that um, investigates this notion of, of presence, of um, embodiment. There's a team of neuroscientists at the University of Barcelona, Mel Slater, Maria Sanchez Vives, and they've coined the phrase, response as if real, R-A-I-R. -R. And it's essentially, yeah, the way in which your, your brain can be tricked or fooled into really believing that you're somewhere, somewhere where you're not. And it's not just in here, you respond in a, a, a visceral, physical way as well. Here's a very quick early study in this um, discipline from 2007. What's going on here, you can see in the picture. The subject is seated. He's wearing um, what we call HMD head-mounted um, display. So he's seeing what is being tracked by the camera behind him. And essentially, at some point, the researcher has a hammer, and he brings it down in front of the camera, and the person who's sitting in front flinches as though he's being hit with a hammer. You know, it's an old notion, right? Think of the Lumiere brothers and the train coming to the screen and people racing to get out of the cinema, but it's, it's, a, it's a whole new, much more sophisticated iteration of that um, phenomenon. Okay, so now um, I'm going to walk through a few of the pieces that we've developed. And these first few were done by, just by Nonny before I was on the scene, but I want to give you a sense of the, of the evolution of this medium. Um, so the first piece that Nonny built was about the Guantanamo Bay, the US prison um, in Cuba. This was before virtual reality. This was built in Second Life. I'm sure you're all familiar with that, the virtual um, alternative world. And it was actually the perfect kind of topic on which to try this experiment, because Guantanamo Bay was off limits to pretty much anyone, right? No press, no civilians. It was a, it was a kind of secret, clandestine prison camp. Um, so Nonny's thought was, how can we try and find, you know, get some sense of what it actually looks like, what it feels like, and make that accessible to the public. Um, and the sources, there weren't many sources, but there were some. There were pictures that had been smuggled out by um, a US soldier who kind of um, wanted to blow the whistle a little bit. And there were also, um, at some point, there were accounts by former detainees who were released. So we took sources from multiple places and in Second Life, built a kind of simulacrum of what it looked like from the photos and what detainees had described in their interrogation logs. So now I'm going to play you a little clip. As soon here. as I had put on my orange jumpsuit, I was thrown into the back of a C-17 transport plane and... You are immediately bound, and then a black hood comes over the vision of your avatar. Shut up! <laughs> We then integrated some sounds that were based on descriptions of what real detainees heard. When the black hood is removed, you find that you're in a cage. Most of the footage is from original Defense Department shots of detainees in Guantanamo Bay. A replica of Camp Delta will be added to this camp X-ray soon. So that was the first piece, uh, which we actually rebuilt later in, uh, in VR for the... Um, the Moscow Art Museum, but it was built originally in, uh, in, thir in Third Life, Second Life, rather. So that got Nonny interested in a very specific um, 
element that had come out of these uh, detainee testimonials, which was the use of stress positions. Okay, this is a very controversial um, use by the um, Bush administration of the way in which detainees were held. And we had descriptions, okay, from interrogation logs, but again, no photographs, no kind of documentary evidence. But the descriptions were of people having their hands behind their back and having to either, either stand or kind of sit or somewhere in between for, for hours on end in an impossibly painful physical situation. So the next thought was, how do we try and give you know, an audience, a user, some sense of what that looks like and feels like? And this was the first piece that we built using what we were then calling HMD, head-mounted display. Now, now we just say goggles, but that, this was a term at the time. And here's the first piece where it starts to get interesting from a journalistic perspective, because we, look, we're treading a fine line. We use actual, you know, real footage, found footage, but also sometimes we have to do the equivalent of what would be, you might call a dramatic reenactment. So in the detainee reports, right, they describe being in a room where they could hear through the walls in a very muffled way, people shouting, sit down, stand up, sit down, stand up. But we had no sort of documentary evidence of that. So we had to kind of build it ourselves. We hired an actor in this case to, to say that, sit down, stand up, and recorded in a muffled background. So that would be part of the experience. And this is what that one looked like. On this head-mounted display, if this is uncomfortable, tell me. One thing I want to point out, and this, you know, I will, I know I will sound like a broken record. I keep coming back to this notion of presence and how powerful a sensation that is. But as you can see here, here's one of the, one of the people going through the experience. Everyone was seated straight up like this. But when they were, every single person, when they were asked afterwards, what position were you in during the experience, they all reported that they had been sat forward like this, just from having seen themselves reflected in that mirror. That, 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 that was what they were convinced of. Um, so again, we constructed that experience. We, we weren't sure what kind of documentary grounds we were really standing on. Uh, I guess we were, felt somewhat vindicated when le afterwards uh, there was a video released of British soldiers and their Iraqi prisoners um, in, a, in stress positions. I'll show you a little clip of this, but it, it, you know, we, were not, we were not far off the mark. <laughs> Sit down, stand up, sit down, stand up. You fucking headbutt! Anyway, okay. So, um, next project, we're, we're getting technically more advanced, we're getting a bit more ambitious. This project was much closer to home. This was part of a, uh, a program at the University of Southern California called Hunger in the Golden State, and it was designed to bring, raise public awareness about um, the fact that, yes, even in California, the place that people assume to be a, a rich, wealthy place, a lot of people live under the poverty line and don't have enough to eat. So uh, our project was called Hunger in LA, and the idea was to document a food bank in downtown Los Angeles, basically people standing on line to get, to get food handouts. And it, we were going to put it together using um, still images of a line of people, but actual real, this is the first time we used real audio, so we sent a sound engineer to capture the sound of this line of people and what was going on. As it happened, while our sound engineer was on the scene, there was a very dramatic incident where a guy um, uh, had a seizure and collapsed on the spot. He was diabetic, he didn't get his food in time, an ambulance came, blah, blah, blah. so there's a very sort of kind of dramatic event. And uh, so we basically recreated, more or less, the people in that line, not person by person, but using sort of 
um, animations made by people at the university, synced them up to the audio, and created an experience that, in which you could walk around, right? So we set up a space about 20 foot by 20 foot. You wear our, our, our special goggles, and you can move around in this space freely, and the world reacts to your movement. And I'll give you a little bit of set. This, in this clip, I'll give you a little bit of sense of what it's like to look around inside there. At some point on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see uh, the viewpoint of someone with the goggles who's inside it, and you'll see how he's reacting to what's going on. Okay. Okay, he's having a seizure. Okay. Need. Need help. Somebody is yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please. Is calibre, is falling down right now. Oh hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Uh, 80, uh, the is, is, is. Okay, so you get, it, you get a sense of what it's like to be, to be interacting with that experience. And again, uh, this notion of presence and of the, the sort of the, the physical, visceral sense of being there. You know, these figures that you can see, if you chose to, of course, you could walk straight through them, you know, like a ghost. They're not, they're not really there. But Hardly anyone who does this experience does that. Everyone is very sort of sensitive to walk around people. It, that's how real that it feels. Um, I'll show you a couple more images here. Again, talking about, and that generates a very strong emotional response. So many people get down on the ground because they want to help this guy who's, who's fallen. That, that, that's the sort of sense of realism that it engenders. Just a couple of clips here of different people doing this. And finally, this was the first virtual reality project ever to be shown at the Sundance Film Festival in 2012. That was a, a, a huge um, debut for Nonny. And just one more clip on the, again, the strong emotional response that we saw there. As someone comes out of the experience. So what do you think? Oh, you're crying. You're crying. Gina, you're crying. Okay, um, so <clears throat> Sundance was great exposure for us. That led to the next big commission from a big film festival, from the Tribeca Film Festival in 2014. So this was the next piece uh, called Use of Force, and this was, uh, again, scaling up. We used uh, new techniques, told it in some ways a bigger story, um, and we were trying to raise public awareness about a, um, alt an all-too-common kind of event in America. Uh, this is the story of an undocumented Mexican immigrant called Anastasio Rojas. He had lived in the U.S. for 20 years, had a family, fell on hard times, was caught shoplifting, um, was deported to Mexico. He tried to get back across the border, and he was caught coming back across the border, and he was beaten by U.S. border guards. He went to complain to their supervisor, and the supervisor responded by sending him back to the same guards for another beating. So he was beaten and tasered a second time, and he ended up dying of his injuries. Um, so, you know, again, an all too common um, event in America, and one we were trying to um, bring greater public awareness to this. And we use several new techniques in this piece because the technology is developing and we're figuring out better how to work in this medium. <clears throat> First, this is the first time we'd used user-generated user content, right? So there were, many people saw this happen, and two of them actually uh, created some kind of record of it, both with their cell phones. There was one person on a ground level, look, kind of looking through some, um, some railings, and he captured it on his cell phone, but it never got a very blurry, grainy piece. Then there was a woman on a higher level, on a balcony of the, bu the building next door, and she got a bird's eye view of where you could really see exactly what was going on, but her cell phone was running out of power. So she only had about a minute's worth of footage. And this gave Nonny the idea that we could incorporate, in some ways, a gaming element into this piece to put you in that person's position. You're seeing something really bad going on. You have a chance to document it and, and capture some important um, testimony, but you've only got 60 seconds. So one, what and where do you shoot? And uh, thirdly, to increase the element of realism and, and sort of improve the, the quality of the, of the footage, we got this woman who, who had um, 
done the shooting and brought it to the lab in LA and did a scan. Um, I'll go back to it. Did a scan of her face and her body so we could recreate her in a, in a more kind of uh, realistic way. So here's a little bit of the raw footage uh, from the guy that was standing down on the ground. You can't see very much. You can later, but I don't want to show you the whole thing, but it's, it, this was very grainy. And you can hear the sounds in the background. Um, this was the view from up above the balcony, and this was the woman who recorded that short scene. And these, this is the process of taking the photo and the body scans that we did. So we had, we had her in the lab, we had, we had her actually reproduce her movements and her reactions at the time. So she kind of acted out the whole thing for us again. So in the crucial part, again, you're up above looking down. And this goes back to my, what I keep saying about presence and embodiment. When we showed this at Tribeca last year in New York, Okay, you're in a room, you're, you're in New York, you're in a room, you've seen the room, it's flat, it's got walls. You put on the goggles, you're in this scene, and so many people go to the balcony, and they very gingerly look down because they're scared to walk off the balcony. That's how strong the sense of embodiment is, right? You see people again and again step up and peer over even though there's no real balcony there. <clears throat> okay. Uh, this is a little bit of a long video clip. I want to show you the whole thing. Uh, the American web, uh, website BuzzFeed, I'm sure you're familiar with, um, got very interested in this, and we went to their studios and set the piece up for them. So this piece captures both what it's like inside this experience of use of force, but also it captures the, um, the reactions of the journalists who wanted to see it, what they were anticipating seeing, and then uh, what it actually was like for them, and then their conclusions at the end. So it's a great study of the interplay between um, expectations and conclusions when you see one of these pieces. It's a little long, but bear with me. I think it's very illustrative of, of exactly what we're trying to do. I don't even know what these are, I guess cameras? Looks like somebody's gonna shock me. That guy's holding a lightsaber back there. I think virtual reality really is like the next big thing. I think it's the new video game or whatever that means. It's so weird, there's like all these people and I'm like, what is about to happen? How's this look with my hair? Pretty good, right? Oh, got it. Whoa! This is gonna simulate a cell phone, so it's gonna mm -hmm. be when you press this button here, yeah. and you hold it up in front of you, a cell phone will appear, and you'll have 60 seconds to record whatever you want until you, before your battery dies. Oh, I see. Oh my god. That's even crazier. All right, so there's a bunch of cops here. They're like standing around, something's going on. Oh, right here. Uh, that's not cool. Like on the other side of a fence, there's all these people just like kicking and beating this man and he's screaming. Look at this, and nobody's doing anything about it. Of course nobody's doing anything about it, right? Of course, because that's what people do, they just watch. It's kind of messed up. Oh, here we go. I couldn't tell before, but I think he's handcuffed. I'm looking above, I'm seeing the, the horror. Hey, we're, we're recording you! Already not moving, but there's like five dudes beating him. Same thing, they just are not stopping. I don't know, I mean, I just, I can't believe that that, like, is real. I uh, did not expect a recreation of a real life beating. Said I thought it was going to be some sort of, uh, possibly some, uh, you know, entertaining game. That was, that was not the case. You feel kind of like, 
helpless and isolated. Hopefully in that situation you actually would be able to like somehow stop it, but I do think like the next best thing is recording it. I wonder what I would really do. Like I know you want to say stuff, it's okay to say stuff, but it's like you, I don't have the power to go and arrest the police. It's, maybe that's problematic. I think when you see something like that, you're like, wow, that was horrible, but at least like the one comfort that I have is like, the United States justice system will do something about it and like people that do bad things get punished for that. And then like what we've been seeing the past few weeks is like sometimes that doesn't happen. The thing that was really sort of dis disorienting is that it wasn't one cop doing it and his partner, it was all these other cops sort of standing around and watching. I think every police officer in the United States probably needs to experience what I just experienced. I think everyone should give this a shot. And it should not only be for entertainment. I think there should be a whole universe of stuff that we can use this for. And this is definitely something I didn't consider at all. And it's really effective. Um, yeah, so that, and that piece has had a, uh, almost 700,000 views on BuzzFeed. So it's been a great sort of uh, exposure for us. And that was exactly the response, obviously, we'd love to get from journalists, that they think it's going to be gaming, but actually it's used for a much more uh, substantive purpose and, and that it works in that sense. So it's, not, it's a, it's a, a cross-media melding of those two things. Um, so Use of Force uh, partly helped us get our next big um, commission, which was from the World Economic Forum to do a piece um, uh, shining spotlight on some of, what was, some of what was going on in Syria, the civil war in Syria. So this was uh, commissioned for Davos last year, to, in January 2014, and it was a, a bigger commission, a bit more ambi ambitious. We had a slightly bigger budget to use, so we're, again, we're enabled to sort of refine and develop our techniques. So several new things came into play here. First of all, we did a multi-part narrative. We can have, have, actually have chapters within the piece. So the, the first section was a, um, a piece of, again, found footage, a video that was on YouTube of um, uh, there's a girl singing in the street in Aleppo, and then an explosion goes off in the background and mayhem erupts. So we took that and we rendered it into our CGI environment. Um, we also had the budget for the first time to send a, do a documentary crew of our own to a refugee camp on the Iraqi border, so we captured more footage there, of, um, more footage there that we could use for the piece. We were able to do multiple facial scans of lots of the people involved. Um, and also, again, going back to the, you know, to what extent can we be objective journalists, we used some symbolic elements, because um, Nani wanted to give a sense of the sheer, volu the sheer numbers of children who um, were lost or displaced, and it's hard to do that with real people, so she created these white ghostly figures, each one of which represents a thousand children. It's an inner scene at the end. So again, several new techniques being tried out. More, more false facial scans. And here's a very brief clip from that piece. So this was at Davos last year. Um, all cra crazy range of people came through to see it, from um, Peter Gabriel in that slide to John McCain, of all people, no comment, and a lot of obviously Syrian delegates. Um, someone who saw it um, asked us if we wanted to put it up uh, at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, uh, just very off the cuff. So we put it up at the, in the museum for three days, uh, there was no marketing, no announcement whatsoever. Basically, if you happen to be at the V&A Museum anyway, and you saw this thing, you'd come and try it out. We were packed out for three days, and um, we had 54 pages of comments in the guest book of people responding to this, this experience. And I'll just, one, my favorite example just here, someone wrote, a powerful tool to create awareness of a great ill 
in the world. So, and again, I, I feel like I keep saying this again and again, but we keep being reminded that people have, that these experiences create very strong emotional responses. And that's really what we're trying to do. So like, bring people's attention to these things and, and move them in a way that you can't necessarily be moved in other media. Okay, almost there, getting to the end. This is our, um, our most recent completed project, and this was definitely kind of a, a shift in direction for us for a couple of reasons. So we made a, a, a piece about the Trayvon Martin killing in Florida. Um, African-American teenager who was shot and killed by George Zimmerman, a member of a, a volunteer neighborhood watch organization. Um, obviously a very, very highly publicized case. So we, a variety of things we're trying to show here. One that we, you know, we, um, up till this point, we'd only made these very big projects that we had to set up our special environment and walk around it, and we took a long time to build these pieces. We actually, we wanted to get, show that we could become part of the news cycle. So make a piece faster and lighter. So fast enough that it could be part of the news coverage of an event, and also with fewer resources so that we could make more of them and be part of the, part of the news dialogue. So yes, the goal was, you know, one one full-time person, two half-time people made this in two weeks. Also, we wanted to start to be able to get this content out to a wider range of people. So instead of having to come to one of our own installations, you can see this piece on the Samsung Gear VR or the Google Cardboard. And these goggles are becoming much more um, ubiquitous. The Gartner Group predicts that by 2000. Mm, 18, there'll be 25 million goggles in distribution in the world. So it's definitely happening, right? This will become a kind of ubiquitous medium, and we want to start to make this content available to, to more people. And this piece, again, was shown at Tribeca just a few, weeks ago, a few weeks ago in New York last year. And here's the other way in which this, um, this thing, which, I mean, eight years ago, this seemed so crazy, and it took, like, a server, you know, the size of this desk, right, to power the experience. And it's amazing how far we've come, and also how far, how much more accessible the materials are now to build these pieces. So the Trayvon piece we made mostly found using found elements. There is security camera footage of Trayvon when he's um, in a, um, a convenience store before the, 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 before the event. There are the 911 calls to the police. Okay, these are a matter of public record, and that audio actually is a fantastic objective kind of narrative of a, a lot of what happened. Um, but additionally, the event took place in this housing complex in Florida, in Sanford, Florida, called Twin Lakes. And that's what it looks like. And that's what the interior of the condos look like. All this information now is now kind of open source public record. So you can find on the web 3D architectural renderings, both of the, the exteriors and of the interiors of those houses. So you can pull those down and quite quickly and lightly start to construct these kinds of experiences. So we're moving towards a more kind of plug and play way of being able to build these build and tell these stories. Similarly with the car. In the piece you can see the car that George Zimmerman is sitting in. There are 3D renderings of pretty much every car in the market available on the internet for a couple of hundred dollars. So these, the materials now are much more available and much more easily accessible. So um, I'm just going to show you a couple of minutes of this clip and this is in the housing estate when George Zimmerman makes the call to the police. So the audio that you're hearing is the actual 911 tape. And we begin with him in the car, and then we shift to scenes around the complex as various, pe various residents, people who lived there, started to call in saying, hey, I'm hearing some people struggling, something's going on, oh my god, I've heard gunshots. So the whole narrative can be told via these calls, these 911 calls to the police. Check me out. He's got something in his hands. I don't know what his deal is. 
Okay, so there we're inside one of the condos. It looks actually looked very dark to me for me. I'm not sure how much you could see what was going on, but um, but again, we built this piece very specifically for the Google Cardboard, and it's very illustrative to see how you have to work with, to within the technical limitations of the medium. So that cardboard is powered by your phone, nowhere near the processing power of what we normally work with. So one of the reasons we could build this piece and make it look sort of convincing was that it was, it was a dark, rainy night. So you, you can't really see the visual details in too much clarity. You know, one of the elements that, that go into, into deciding to make that. Um, that's pretty much it. We're almost there. I'm just going to leave you with our upcoming um, big project that we're working on right now. Um, it's a big commission, and it's, a, it's a, a first for us in that we're partnering with a, a, a big media news organization. We're working with Al Jazeera America to make a piece called Death in Plain Sight. Um, so Al Jazeera America has a fantastic uh, documentary series called Fault Lines, and this is an extension of one of those pieces. It's about domestic violence in South Carolina. Um, an average of three women is killed every day in America by their domestic partner, mostly shot. Um, and the state in the country with the highest rate of deaths is South Carolina, which has, surprise, surprise, the laxest gun laws in the entire country. So it's a piece trying to, um, to raise public awareness about this topic. It's going to debut at TED Women on May 27. Nonny's going to present it. And um, sponsored by Google, they're going to provide cardboard goggles. Everyone who's there will get the goggles, take away, and, and, be, able, and be able to see it. And I, I can tell you just very briefly, Again, into how much better we're getting at uh, the realism with how we render these environments. So above is, it centers around an incident where a, a woman was shot by her partner in her home. Her sister was present in the house, and the sister, again, was on the phone to the police the entire time. So the entire sequence of events was captured on a 911 tape. Um, up top is, the, is a picture of the house, and below is the, is the rendering that we've made of what, it, of what it's going to look like in the experience. So that's what we do. We basically take techniques and platforms and, and knowledge from a variety of media and, and genres, from documentary journalism, from video games, and put them together in this kind of innovative way to basically try and put you on scene, right? To put your virtual embodied self in the action. So you really feel like you're there and you have that powerful emotional response to what's going on. That's, 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 uh, that's our goal. We make a virtual reconstruction of the scene. We mix all kinds of elements to bring it to life. Some of them are real, some of them are constructed. And we want to create that sense of presence. That's really what it's all about. And again, hard to explain if you haven't um, experienced it. I urge you to try it. We have a VR section set up here where you can see a bunch of these events. And um, that's it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Oh. We have plenty of time for questions. Ah. Can you give me, if you're willing to answer, then can you give me a sign of hands, please? Okay. Did newspaper change anything? Uh, did radio change anything? Or did TV change anything? And will this change anything without a shift of mindset how uh, humans act towards other humans? I don't think so. Um, 
Did any of those media change? Well, I think those, I think all... Yeah, yeah. of course they changed a lot, but um, this footage we saw now just showed that they didn't change much. Um, I think, but I think each of those media that you talk about, right, tools come into existence. They are, they're, they, they're born, they're created, they're constructed by us, right? And then once those tools exist, I think as journalists, it's our responsibility to use them as best we can to try and tell the stories that we think should be told, right? So there are forces for good and, and, and bad that express themselves via, via newspapers, via print, via TV, via all these media. Um, you know, all we can do is try to use them as best we can. Uh, you know, what's the alternative? Just ignore it and say we don't care about it and we'll let someone else kind of take it over. And I think I actually disagree with you. I think, I think, I think all those things have changed the world. In, I mean, it's, how, do you just, how, do you just, how do you sort of define literal physical change? But, you know, investigative journalism has brought huge changes to the world, right? Newspaper stories have un uncovered all kinds of injustice um, and, and wrongs that have then been addressed and, and righted. Not all of them, for sure, but what can we do other than, other than keep trying and keep trying? I, for example, the, um, the use of force piece, you know, no one had ever been charged in that case. They still haven't, but we tried. We, we tried to raise public awareness about what happened, and we, you know, we generated a massive response from the people who saw it. Yeah, no, no um, action has been brought as yet, but better to try than, than to do nothing and to ignore this medium that is coming into being, I think. Yeah. Hello. Okay. First of all, uh, thank you for the insight. But um, I have a question because I think you skipped the slide there earlier about the um, obvious ethical questions that are raised by this kind of journalism. Yep. And I would like to know what uh, thoughts went into that from your end. I wish I had the answer to that question. Obviously, I don't. Maybe that's why I skipped the slide. Um, I think the, the slide you're talking about was immediately after the point in the, the, the sit-down, stand-up piece where, yes, where we hired that actor to, to say, to shout, sit down, stand up, sit down, stand up. I guess what I'm really saying there is that, um, you know, I mean, yes, in some sense that was a dramatic reenactment. We don't know exactly what it sounded like, exactly what it looked like, so we kind of took our best guess. And it is in the nature of this medium that you don't know. There is no, you know, recorded do uh, video footage of what happened. So, I think all we can do is try and be responsible and, and use the medium as best as we can. Um, sometimes we have to fill in and use our imaginations. But, you know, I think we're in the process of defining what the best practices are. Because the alternative is, again, we don't try and we don't show it at all. So then you're kind of caught between, caught between two stools. But that's, that's one of, yes, look, there, are, there is a certain school of thought, I will say, that is sort of against the whole notion of using computer-generated imagery to represent these people. Um, and this school of thought says that, you know, this is only going to be a real medium when we're using 360-degree video to actually get real footage. Look, obviously, we disagree. I think... On some level, it comes down to, you know, we're telling stories, right? Even when you craft a story, whether it's in print or a documentary film, you know, nothing is completely purely objective, right? You're, obviously, there's, there's a structuring that goes into the, the creation of a narrative. So we want to tell powerful, truthful stories, and we have to use a bunch of techniques to do that. Um, and some of, the, yeah, some of those are not strictly objective, but I think that's, that's just, it's just, how, it's just how it works. Hello. Ah, uh, hey. now it works. Um, you partly answered my question already, but what do you think of uh, 3D video instead of 3D models like uh, the guys from Clouds or, or Cloud over Cedra did? Yep. I don't know if you saw that movie. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, different ways to skin a cat. Um, you know, to me... Like, there's a certain school of thinking that says, yes, right, it should all be done in video. But to me, I, honestly, I parallel that with, you know, there was a, a school of art in the early 80s of, of kind of hyper-photorealism, so making paintings that looked so realistic they were almost like photographs. And there was a certain way of thinking that said, great, we're done now. Like, now we're really capturing reality, so we don't need to go any further. But 
No, because art is not about just a sort of documentary reportage thing. It's about, again, telling a story and, and generating an emotional response on the part of the viewer. So you can certainly do great things with 360-degree video. It's, I would say it's in its early days, and it's still very actually laborious and time-consuming because when you shoot with those cameras with the multiple lenses, you have to do what's then called stitching to, to bring together all, the, um, all the, the streams of footage. So it's laborious and it's time-consuming. And even though it's based on reality, it doesn't necessarily give you a better, more powerful story. So I think, I think, I, I think both options are valid. Obviously, we've worked mostly with the CGI to date, but we're, looking at, we're, also, we're also looking at 360 video. We're, you know, again, for us, it's about telling the story in the best way possible and moving the audience as, as best we can. Uh, hello, I have a question over here. Hello, <laughs> I'm waving my hand here. Right on, to I can't right. see you. Here. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you already mentioned that uh, technologies like 3D models are becoming more, uh, more available on the internet. Yeah. But at the same time, I have the feeling that your uh, virtual reality technology is more like for museums at the moment, for exhibitions, uh, but nothing that could become a mass medium that is uh, available to, uh, to a wide public, even at home, po uh, possibly. Do you have a vision or a perspective when virtual reality may become something that is available Absolutely. To, to the Absolutely. whole audience, both on the side of the producers, like that uh, any medium can produce something like this with, uh, with relative... With yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so, so the Gartner Group has gone on record saying they believe that by, again, by 2018, which is not so very far away, there'll be 25 million goggles out in the world. You know, we've seen some of, the, um, some of the lightweight lenses that now exist. Uh, they're amazing. I mean, well, they're, well, they're well like a feather. They give you improved vision than even the ones that we already have. Yes, I fully believe that two, three, four years from now, there will be goggles that will be as comfortable and as lightweight as slipping in your headphones now to listen to music. It'll be as, as normal a part of your daily activity. And there'll be channels providing you content, either directly through the goggles or downloadable from the web. I have no doubt that this is, this is going to become um, a ubiquitous phenomenon. We're not there yet. And look, like I said, the whole reason we did the Trayvon Martin piece was to start creating in this more widely available platform we didn't deliberately choose to make something that was sort of, you know, exclusive and, and hard to access. It was, in the early days, that was the only way you could do it. I mean, we build our own headsets because right now there are no other, other headsets that perform the way we need them to do. But we, please, you know, we're, we're so ready for someone else to solve that problem because we don't really, we're not really hardware people. We are, we're journalists. We want to concentrate on the stories, not on the mechanics. But, um, yeah, I mean... There's always going to be a threshold of, yes, do I want to physically put on goggles? But like I said, I think it'll be very, very similar. Pretty much close to the, as simple as like putting in your headphones. I think that's coming within, within, within two or three years. Are there any more questions? Just a quick question yep. over here. Hi, I am, my name is Nadia. I'm from a Danish newspaper, and I was just wondering if you have experienced that immersive journalism is met with uh, some sort of skepticism. Um, I'm thinking because it's kind of related to gaming, as you mentioned. Has it been hard to convince yep. people to fund this, to yep. support your project yep. and ideas? The, the, most skeptical, the most skeptical response that I have encountered so far is from myself because I've known Nani for a long, long time, uh, but much longer than I, when I got involved with her in this company. And when I heard about what she was doing, I was like, you know, really? Um, it, it seemed, I, I was very skeptical about it. But, I mean, it really is kind of crazy. You, when you put the headset on and you experience it, it, it kind of takes you over in a way that's, that's, you can't deny it. It's very powerful. And the craziest thing to me, because look, I'm, I'm not a super techie person. I'm more, you know, come from a more old school journalist background. I've seen now enough different experiences in enough different um, devices, right? From the the very high end these to the Google Cardboard. It's incredible to me how the 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 ratio between the sophistication of the technology that you're using to have the experience and the 
power of your response to that experience. So I would like to say that, no, you can get you know, anything you need from you know, words on a page. But I've, I've seen it myself now that, that as the technology gets better, it gets more and more powerful at, um, at convincing you. So, of course, there's some skepticism. I was skeptical to begin with, but I've, you know, I've, I've seen, I mean, I've seen a lot of people go through these experiences now, and, you know, the vast majority are really kind of moved and impressed. So, um, yeah, mostly, mostly no. Is the I guess is the, is the short answer. Okay, if we see no further hands going up, I know that when we first came across Sandra and I, this uh, amazing work that you're doing and the topic of immersive journalism, the we found there was maybe a thin line between being moved and even being traumatized or haunted by that experience yourself. I know that we spent the rest of the afternoon discussing this mm -hmm. issue, so I expect there will be a lot of debate after this and after your talk as well. James, can you please give our best wishes to Nani? I will do that. And can you please give a very big round of applause to James oh, for you. being here today thank with you. us? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>